Hi, thanks for listening to Top Audiobooks. Remember to follow our channel here on the platform, and also our social media. We prepare a graphic of the book, with the author's key points and main ideas. Click that book graphic link in description now, and have access to an illustrated material with simple and easy steps, so you know everything about the book in minutes. You're listening to the book summary presentation of Daring Greatly, How the Courage to Be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, Love, Parent, and Lead by Dr. Brene Brown. As human beings, we have a fundamental need for connection, love, and belonging. Yet we fear rejection and are afraid we're not good enough. We try to hide our vulnerabilities only to create a greater disconnect with our families, communities, and work. Based on 12 years of research, this book explains the concept of vulnerability and how to embrace it for wholehearted living and fulfilling connections. Introduction Having worked and researched widely on the constructs of human connection, Brown discovered that vulnerability is one of the most powerful explanations for human behaviors. In the book, Brown explains vulnerability and shame and why embracing, rather than avoiding, them is the key to more fulfilling connections. Daring Greatly is about embracing vulnerability and imperfection to live wholeheartedly and engage courageously. In this summary, we've consolidated the ideas into four parts. Understanding vulnerability, managing shame, removing the armor, and closing the gap. Part 1. Understanding Vulnerability Most of us live in cultures of scarcity. We are constantly measuring and comparing what we have against what we want, what we don't have, what others have, or even how things used to be. We long for connection and belonging, yet we're afraid of being unworthy if we don't live up to a standard or ideal. Many of our deepest insecurities involve being not smart enough, not lovable enough, not rich enough, not slim enough, etc. There are three key components of scarcity, shame, comparison, and disengagement. Shame comes from measuring our self-worth by how much we achieve, earn, produce, conform, etc., or when we use fear of rejection or humiliation to manipulate others. Comparison is about comparing and evaluating people against fixed yardsticks rather than appreciating them for their uniqueness. Disengagement is about not daring to take risks and speak up or competing for attention. When you examine these components, you'd realize the opposite of scarcity is not abundance, but enough. When you feel you're good enough, regardless of what you do or don't do, you'll dare to engage despite uncertainty and emotional risks. Brown calls this wholeheartedness. When we remove labels and stereotypes to see people through the lenses of vulnerability, we start to understand the real struggles beneath their actions. For example, people complain that the younger generation is becoming increasingly self-centered and obsessed with social media. From the perspective of vulnerability, many of these kids have been influenced by reality TV and celebrity culture to believe that they're only as good as the number of followers or likes they have. They're simply trying to feel special in a world of never enough. Debunking the vulnerability myths. To understand vulnerability, it helps to understand what it is not. First, vulnerability is not weakness. It's merely a feeling of being naked, a sense of uncertainty, 
and emotional exposure. This is an inevitable part of life, and there's nothing good or bad about it. When we associate vulnerability with weakness, we try to avoid it and hide our feelings as a mistaken sign of strength. For example, love is uncertain, but avoiding love to escape vulnerability makes life meaningless. In fact, things that make you feel vulnerable, such as doing something controversial or saying sorry, are typically associated with courage and truth, not weakness. We see others' vulnerability as courage, but condemn our own as weakness. We want others to be open and accessible to us, yet we're afraid to be open and accessible. Instead of asking yourself, What would I attempt to do if I knew I could not fail? Brown challenges you to ask, What's worth doing even if I fail? Second, vulnerability is not an option. People may claim they don't do vulnerability because they are strong, logical, professional, etc. However, vulnerability is not a choice. Life itself is unpredictable. And we all feel unsure and exposed at times. The key is how we respond to vulnerability. Third, vulnerability is not letting it all out. Embracing vulnerability isn't about bearing your soul to everyone, it's about opening up to people with whom you've cultivated a strong, trusting relationship to share with reciprocity, trust, and boundaries. Building such relationships takes time, and Brown likens it to filling a jar with marbles. We add marbles when people demonstrate that they care. They share their secrets and keep ours. They remember what matters to us, involve us when things go well, and show concern when we face challenges. We remove marbles when the opposite happens. When those closest to us start to become disengaged, we feel hurt because it triggers our feelings of shame, unworthiness, and fear of abandonment. The entire jar can be shattered in the event of a major betrayal. For example, when someone close uses your secret against you. Building trust is a chicken and egg situation. You'd want to feel trust before showing vulnerability. But you must be willing to be vulnerable to gain trust. Finally, vulnerability isn't best tackled alone. Most cultures value the ability to solve problems independently. However, the best way to handle vulnerability is with support from others. Research shows that when someone is willing to be vulnerable, others perceive it to be courageous and gradually open up too. Part 2 Managing Shame. Shame is the agonizing feeling that we're flawed and hence unworthy of love and belonging. All of us experience shame. Everyone is afraid to talk about it, and our silence only gives it even more power. Shame is different from feelings like guilt, humiliation, and embarrassment because we see the flaw as a part of who we are. You feel guilt when you think you've done something wrong. Your actions seem incongruent with who you are, and you're likely to apologize or make amends. You feel humiliated when you feel you don't deserve a negative outcome. Embarrassment is the least severe and will usually pass quickly. Shame is different because you feel you are bad as a person. For example, I'm such a loser, and you deserve the bad outcomes. Research shows that shame is correlated only with negative outcomes, like violence, aggression, or depression. Building shame resilience. We can't avoid or remove shame from our lives, but we can become more resilient to it. There are four key elements of shame resilience. First, recognize shame. Let's imagine you're writing a book 
and feel unsure about finishing it. As you look deeper, you notice a voice telling you that you're a lousy writer and another one saying you'll be a laughingstock. Brown calls them your gremlins. Learn to identify shame and its triggers. Know and acknowledge when you're feeling shame and start to understand your own self-doubts and self-criticisms. Second, evaluate expectations. Identify the judgments behind the shame, which are often linked to social and cultural expectations. Brown's research revealed 12 key categories of shame, such as appearance and body image, money and work, family, parenting, sex, past trauma, etc. Assess if these expectations are realistic and aligned with your values. For example, is it realistic to have a best-selling book on your first attempt? Are you really a failure if your book isn't popular? Taking a step back to think about your shame helps you to break your fight-or-flight response. Third, get connected. Reach out to someone you trust. Once you feel their empathy and connection, your shame will dissolve. Finally, share it. Shame cannot survive once it's exposed. Don't be afraid to speak about your fears and ask for support. Research shows that people who suffer past trauma recover much better when they use expressive writing or share their stories with others. Once, Brown received an angry email from someone whom she'd refused a speaking engagement. Feeling upset, she wrote an email to her husband to vent, but accidentally clicked send instead of forward. She was drowning in shame when the other party replied to point out her lack of wholeheartedness. Using the elements above, she said, pain, 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 aloud to acknowledge her feelings until she felt better. Then she called her husband and best friend and instantly felt reassured by their empathy and love. She also spoke kindly to herself in the same way she would have comforted someone else. When she was feeling calmer, she wrote a reply to apologize to the other party and set boundaries for future communications. Understanding Gender Differences While shame affects both genders equally, social-cultural expectations create different shame triggers and responses for men versus women. Women expect themselves to look naturally beautiful, slim, be good at everything, especially motherhood, and to seem to do it all effortlessly. They feel shame when they're not beautiful enough, can't multitask well enough, etc. When shamed, women intuitively respond by criticizing or putting others down, an unconscious attempt to draw attention away from their inadequacies. Men, on the other hand, must never be weak. They must control their feelings, earn more, take charge, and succeed in their careers. When they feel shame, men naturally get angry or shut down. Hi, thanks for listening to Top Audiobooks. Remember to follow our channel here on the platform, and also our social media. We prepare a graphic of the book, with the author's key points and main ideas. Click that book graphic link in description now and have access to an illustrated material with simple and easy steps, so you know everything about the book in minutes. Men and women also attach shame differently to sex and body image. Women are conscious of their bodies and interpret men's lack of interest to mean they're not slim, attractive, or experienced enough. Men, on the other hand, are more concerned if their partners care about them and see rejection as a form of masculine shame that they're not wanted or not good enough. Shame can tear a relationship apart, and gender differences amplify the strain. 
When women feel invalidated, they start criticizing, which triggers men's feeling of inadequacy. The men get angry or shut down, causing women to probe, why won't you talk to me? Which provokes the men even more. Women want their men to open up and let them in. Yet most women can't really accept vulnerability in their men who are supposed to be strong. When women react with disappointment or even disgust, it reinforces men's shame and resolve not to show weakness again. Shame is most painful when it comes from those closest to us. Using a loved one's vulnerability to shame him or her is the most severe breach of trust and can cause permanent scars in the relationship. Cultivating wholeheartedness. Using the four elements of shame resilience, we can build our self-worth and wholeheartedness. Practicing self-love is one of the best ways to nurture courage, self-worth, and our ability to love others. When we feel worthy, we're less likely to judge or criticize others. As you become aware of social cultural expectations, you can identify shame when it surfaces, evaluate it, and make a conscious decision not to play the game. For example, you may realize that missing your child's concert for a work trip does not mean you're a bad mother. And you can learn to love yourself and others for who you really are, rather than what society expects of you. Practice love by trusting and being vulnerable with your loved ones and supporting them in their vulnerabilities. When you see someone struggling with a shameful situation, instead of passing judgment, take the initiative to extend your empathy with a smile or understanding look. This small gesture may help them to feel instantly better. Part 3. Removing the Armor Everyone struggles with vulnerability, including Brown, and we put on different persona or masks to protect ourselves. Even children put on masks, though these are more fleeting and easier to detect. The school bully could actually be masking his need to belong, while the mean girl could be hiding the pain from her parents' divorce. To remove our masks, we simply have to believe that we're enough. In this segment, we'll explain the key types of armor and how to remove them. There are three common vulnerability shields. First, foreboding joy is the feeling that your joyful experiences are too good to be true and won't last. You keep expecting the next disaster to strike and constantly plan for the worst. The solution is to practice gratitude. Focus on what you're grateful for, including the small, ordinary moments like being healthy or having your loved ones by your side. Second, perfectionism is about trying to be perfect to avoid failure or shame. It's different from a healthy pursuit of excellence and only brings more shame. Learn to accept imperfection. Be kind to yourself when you fail or suffer rather than avoid or condemn it. Realize that everyone feels pain and inadequacy and practice mindfulness to separate your fleeting thoughts and feelings from who you really are. Third, People numb themselves using busyness. Outwardly, they take pride in being available 24-7 to their clients, never dropping the ball, etc. But under the busyness is a sense of insecurity. Women are afraid to say no and not please everyone, while men are afraid they're not man enough to handle everything. The antidote is to set boundaries. For example, no work calls after 10 p.m. Cultivate self-worth based on who you are, not what you do. When you stop trying to satisfy everyone, you can focus on what truly matters. 
Brown's research reveals that a deep sense of connectedness or spirituality is a core aspect of wholehearted living. This is about the manner and intent in which you go about your daily life. For instance, are you enjoying your meal or just gulping it down? Are you seeing and connecting with the people you meet, like the cashier or the waiter, or just treating them as objects in the background? We also use many other shields, and here are some examples. Some people classify people or things into win lose extremes, such as success or failure, kill or be killed. They avoid vulnerability, and it's especially common in the military or in people who've suffered trauma, like physical abuse or oppression. The solution is to redefine success. And use the four shame resilience components to restore the ability to face vulnerability. Others may use vulnerability to manipulate, seek attention, or simply release their vulnerability on others who don't share deep trust or connectivity with them. In such cases, people may withdraw and cause even more shame. Get clear on the purpose of your sharing. Consider your feelings and desired outcomes, and manage your boundaries and connections accordingly. People also spend undue amounts of energy to zigzag around vulnerability when it's less effortful to face it directly. Cultivate awareness so you can catch and stop yourself when zigzagging. Finally, we judge others. Whenever we label them as inferior or dismiss them, Brown made a personal choice to stop worrying about bystanders who judge and complain from the sidelines. Instead, she only pays attention to people who are in the arena, that is, those who are actively working on similar challenges and people whom she loves and trusts most, and are always fighting by her side in the arena. Part four: Closing the gap. People desire connection, yet they become disengaged when they feel vulnerable and/or they feel that the other party isn't fulfilling their role in the social contract. In short, a disengagement divide occurs because of the gap between our aspired values—what we want to do, think, and feel—and our practiced values—what we actually do, think, and feel. For instance, children perceive a gap when their parents preach about honesty and respect, but lie or put each other down. As humans, we can't avoid such gaps, but we can become aware of them and seek to close the gaps. Rehumanizing education and work. Shame is a major barrier to creativity. Innovation and learning in our education institutions and workplace. When shame is prevalent, people dare not speak up, try new things, or persevere in face of failure. Finger pointing, gossiping, harassment, and name calling are all signs of shame in a culture. Shame can create scars and self doubts that affect people for life. Such practices spread quickly, and employees who constantly deal with shame at the workplace are likely to use similar behaviors with clients, suppliers, and even family. It's worse when shame is used as a formal management or influencing tool, like public ranking of top and bottom performers. Dealing with shame brings uncomfortable, dark secrets to the light. And the process is both disruptive and irreversible. Brown calls this disruptive engagement. Here are several tips to build shame-resilient organizations. First, support people who are willing to step forward to facilitate honest conversations about shame. Since shame cannot survive in the open, and courage is contagious, such leaders become natural change catalysts. Second, cultivate awareness of shame so it can be identified and stopped immediately before it spreads. Third, 
normalize shame and discomfort so people realize that these feelings are normal and are less afraid to discuss their common struggles and coping strategies. Finally, train employees on the differences between shame and guilt and how to give and receive constructive feedback. For example, for every area for improvement, identify three strengths that the other person has to make the change. Literally and figuratively, sit on the same side of the table as someone to focus your feedback on supporting him or her. And start by inviting feedback so you learn what it's like to be on the receiving end. Wholehearted Parenting The best foundation we can give our children is a sense of love, belonging, and self-worth. Great parenting isn't about having the best strategies and techniques. It's about being the best possible role models given our own imperfections, that is, being the adults we want our children to be. Kids often don't feel they belong in their own families as they don't match up to their parents' expectations. Be conscious of the if-when rules that you're planting. For example, do your kids feel loved only if they achieve certain grades, financial status, or behaviors? For children to feel worthy, they must feel loved just as they are. Let them know that you love them, even if you don't love their choices or behaviors. For instance, telling a lie doesn't make your child a liar, and tripping over something doesn't make him or her a klutz. Rather than try to protect your children from shame, use such experiences to talk about shame and role model shame resilience. Normalize shame by showing your children that everyone faces similar struggles and explain the difference between guilt versus shame when they're young and receptive. Besides sharing the findings from her research and interviews, Brown also reenacts many of her exchanges with her audience and interviewees, as well as her personal experiences and vulnerable moments. These help us to understand the often unspoken vulnerabilities, insecurities, and feelings that everyone has in one form or another. In the book, Brown also includes her complete definitions of concepts like love, connection, shame, as well as several checklists and manifestos. We hope you've enjoyed this book summary presentation of Daring Greatly by Dr. Brene Brown. To get the most from this presentation, we recommend that you take two to three minutes to review our graphic summary, where we've summarized the key ideas from this book into one page of easy-to-digest graphics. This is a powerful way to see, organize, and apply insights to create new breakthroughs in your life. Hi, thanks for listening to Top Audiobooks. Remember to follow our channel here on the platform and also our social media. We prepare a graphic of the book with the author's key points and main ideas. Click that book graphic link in description now and have access to an illustrated material with simple and easy steps so you know everything about the book in minutes.